one of the things that, that, that occurs in your books, I think, is a kind of, uh, well, I could talk specifically, in fact, maybe just move on. Uh, I was very struck in reading, uh, especially The Citadel, the last book in the Book of the New Sun, uh, that the the battle scenes that you described there are, uh, first of all, they reminded me of almost of Civil War battle scenes or World War One battle scenes, but they were very authentic, they seemed to me, and uh, I... I wondered if, if, if well, I'm, I'm sure you talked about this in that book, but what sort of research you did as far as the battle scenes themselves, and if in any way uh, that was maybe came out of your own involvement in being that under oh, fire. Yeah. yeah, and in, in fact, I do talk about this in Castle of the Ottawa, as you, you anticipated. Uh, one of the things that I started to do with that book, and I was trying to do a number of things with that book, but one of the things I wanted to do was show a young man's passage from a position where the, the war was extremely remote up until the fighting. Right. Uh, because I had gone through that kind of thing myself. Uh, the Korean War was much, much more remote to the American people in Vietnam was. You did not have the live television coverage. You didn't have all this. There wasn't the sense of beating up on a lot of poor little peasants. You were fighting the Chinese army. Yeah, right, right, right. You yeah. know, seven million men. And uh, I my, did not think, obviously, uh, at the time that I was drafted, that I was ever going to end up in the fighting. Uh, my father was somewhat afraid that I was and wanted to get me to join the Air Force, something like that, which would have been a six-year enlistment. And uh, the, the draft was two years, and I figured, no, I'll, I'll go in the Army and I'll do my two years. I'll be out and mm -hmm. be a veteran, and I won't have to do that. And I watched myself uh, slowly being sucked into this vortex until at one point, uh, I rode a train all night across Korea, and, uh, no, pardon me, all, all night and all day across Korea. It's just, mm -hmm. This is a slow train. A lot of this time is sitting on siding. And uh, got out, and I could hear the guns firing in the distance. And at this point, it came through to me, you know, my God, I did not miss it. This is it. Here I am, you know. Of course, a month later, I would have thought that I was way behind the line because I was behind the artillery uh, at that point. And most of the time when I was in the infantry, we were up ahead of the artillery. Yeah. The artillery was two or three valley, pardon me, two or three valleys back, shooting over our head. And I wanted to show that kind of a thing. And uh, so I also... Uh, wanted to show a big, complex civilization, and uh, not the simple Simon civilizations that you find in most science fiction novels, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're uh, you supposedly have a, a galactic empire, and it's got a, a culture that it's about as uniform as the culture of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, let's say, you know, mm -hmm. and this is spread over of the thousand light years, well, I think that's silly. I've always thought it was silly. And uh, I wanted to, to show a complex civilization. And I saw as I was uh, started writing this book that one way to show that was to show this young man being drawn from the capital city into the war and, and through the countryside and through the society uh, as he moved from being the citizen of the capital to being a soldier on the front line. In the war itself, I was trying to guess what war might be like for a decadent technology in which there was still some high technology left, still some high technology weapons, but most of that was unavailable. Uh, there was a, an actual time on the actual planet Earth 
about 1950 or 60, somewhere in there, when uh, there was a little civil war being fought in what used to be the Belgian Congo. In that war, there were tribesmen with spears who were being led into battle by European officers with submachine guns, and they were being supported by jet planes. Now, that, that's 20th century Earth, and I wanted to show what that kind of a thing might be like, not taking the, the same literal thing, but taking that kind of a situation. And so I showed uh, people riding animals and so on, at the same time that uh, other people had uh, laser cannon and this sort of... When, when you... Well, uh, when you created the battle, well, there's a couple of things about the battle scenes that struck me. One was, uh, I thought it was, uh, well, interesting, but also accurate. Uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name, Severian. Is that how you pronounce it? Severian. Uh, That's where you, I you, you didn't. Uh, you didn't just have him be a hero. Uh, that is, you, you show him being afraid. Uh, you show him, uh, uh, you know, reacting with hesitation and fear, I think, the way that not not just the way that the, the uh, comic book hero would do. The other thing, though, was the the, the the way that you're able to capture such a vivid. Did did were, were these battle scenes in any way? Um, did you did you research other battles in any oh, way? Oh yeah, well, I, I've read a great deal of history. If you mm -hmm. if you look up there, you'll find tons of history, and there's a lot more of it around. Uh, -huh. uh I don't think I researched anything specifically. Right, but. Uh, this comes out of a lot of reading about the Napoleonic Wars and the Civil War and uh -huh. what have you. Sure. And the Second World War. Uh, by the time we, uh, I want uh, maybe I want to talk a little bit for uh, just just for a few minutes about the kind of development of your your writing during the 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 sixties. Uh, after you sent off this book that was not published. Uh, what happened then? When did you when did you start getting published? Was this with Damon Knight? Was this uh, around 1965? I think. Now, what was the background there? There at this point, you weren't doing it just uh, well. Maybe you're also doing it for money. But what got you back doing that again? Oh, I I, I liked it. it. I liked it. It became a hobby. That's why I say I, I got the bug from writing that that first good successful novel. Mm -hmm. And uh, for years, I had a lot of trouble with Rosemary about that. I'm tempted to tell you that that's off the record, but it doesn't. She knows it. And, uh, in fact, she's heard me tell this stuff. Uh, but, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I guess I've lost the thread well, or I'm trying to, to jump up. I kept writing other stuff, and eventually I sold a little ghost story called The Dead Man to Sir, which is one of those skin magazines, yeah. the poor man's playboy mm -hmm. kind of thing. And uh, I, re I remember vividly how afraid I was that it was a fluke, that I was never going to sell anything else, because I had been writing for years mm -hmm. without selling anything. Mm -hmm. Most people I don't think go through that to the extent that I did. That I did. Uh, in, in retrospect, why weren't you selling? Was it because you were doing things that weren't conventional in some ways, or oh, it was it was a was combination it of everything. I'm still doing things that aren't conventional. Yeah, but uh, I'm doing it better. At least I like to think I'm better. Uh, secondly, I didn't know anything about marketing, and uh, mm -hmm. well, I, I think those two things really cover it pretty well. And I was learning the the, the art. Uh, you know, you don't go out and buy a violin and then go to a symphony orchestra and right. get a job in the orchestra. Uh, you've got to learn to play the damn thing. And for most of us, uh, I think writing is like that. Mm -hmm. Truman Capote got his first five acceptances in one day when he was 17. But I don't think that's normal. I, I think it's a very unusual writer. Um, could you talk a little bit about the way that your I, I, again, I don't know if the, this is the kind of question that you can answer very specifically, but the, the kind of evolution that you're... By the time we get to the, the fifth head of Cerebus, that book seems to me to be a very remarkable and finely crafted work. Uh, what kind of evolution do you see in your writing during the 60s that would, that would, in a sense, have 
were there any pivotal stories during that period? Were there, you say you were learning the, the craft. Were there, were there things, specific kind of breakthroughs that you, you can recall or anything like that? Or was it just a slow? No, I, I think the breakthroughs really came before I started selling anything. And uh, there, there was a point at which I wrote a story that's never been published, never will be published, I don't think I've got a copy anymore, uh, called In the Jungle. And it was about a kid who wanders into a hobo jungle. And at the time I wrote it, I thought that was one of these, the milestones of American literature. You know, I thought this is a terrific story. You know, the, uh, the way... Uh, Romancing the stone starts yeah. with the woman crying at the typewriter and saying, oh, God, I'm so good. <laughs> I felt like that about that story. And I sent it out to about 18 different places I ever saw. And I put it away. And two or three years later, I pulled it out and I read it over. I realized that the story I had had in my head had never gotten onto the paper. Mm -hmm. I had this wonderful story, but it stayed all up here. And uh, really, all that I learned to do was make the thing run down my arm. Um, we can talk a little bit about something that I think I find in a lot of your, your fiction that I, that, that I personally like a lot, and it's one of the things that seems very distinctive. Uh, some of your, 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 your stories uh, proceed in a relatively straightforward presentation of action, but a lot of them... Uh, they move forward in a more complicated fashion with the events being filtered uh, through memory, dreams, stories within stories, uh, different narrative points of view, and so forth. Really about again what what seems to be one of the, the the most striking aspects of of a lot of your work and uh, is I again I think you know the sort of thing I'm talking about is the sort of complex way that you present the the, the works and what first of all uh, are you trying to draw the, are, are you interested in presenting these kinds of uh, uh, points of view or narrative perspectives in a way to draw the reader in as a collaborator. In other words, what interests you in that type of form? Well, the only thing that I can say there is that it has always seemed to me that a story should be told in a way that's appropriate to the story that you have to tell. Mm -hmm. And for many of the stories that I choose to tell, uh, something like that tends to be the way that seems to me most appropriate, the way that works. Uh, I don't think of a story and then say, gee, should I tell us in the first person or the third person? Let's flip a coin and so on. It seems to me that there are certain stories that are first person stories or certain stories that are, are third person stories. And so on and so forth. Uh, there, there are dream stories. And I try and find the one that I think is most appropriate to the subject matter. But of course, the thing bites its own tail in a way, because as I work on the story, then the subject matter becomes appropriate to the, the means of telling it. Yes. Because uh, it's not really a simple this so that, uh, this and that are really interacting uh, all through the story. You know, the, the old hackneyed medium is the message. Well, a lot of your work seems to be exploring various, uh, in, in a sense, a lot of your work seems to me to be about, uh, well, human perception, the, the sort of am the difficulty of, uh, of understanding with certainty what's going on around you. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that the, when you just said that the subject and the form uh, inter interact, that, that, that seems very much the case. But that, that's realism, you see. That's the way it really is. Uh, it's the other thing uh, that is unreal. 
you know, you, you, you sit there and you think that you're seeing me, and I think I'm seeing you. But what I'm really reacting to is a light pattern that has stimulated certain nerve endings in the retina of my eyes. And that light pattern is reflected from you. And that's what I call seeing you. You know, uh, change the mechanism in my eyes, change the nature of the light, and you become different as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, you think you're hearing me, but you're actually hearing everything a little bit after I've said it. Because it requires a finite and measurable quantity of time for my voice to reach you. That's one of the, in fact, the way I'd originally written, written this question was, uh, it seemed to me that the effect um, is to kind of reinforce the, the, something that, again, comes up, it seems to me, over and over in your fiction, the kind of awareness that all experiences, uh, no experiences, can be reduced to these sort of simple formulas, uh, objective formulas, that I think realistic fiction has tended to encourage, sure. this okay. kind of simple causality that you were just describing. I've noticed a couple of times with, uh, again, I've only seen one or two short interviews with you, but a couple of times the, the critic will say something to you like, uh, why do you write things that are so, uh, that, that people can't figure out? But that doesn't seem to me to be the point at all, because it, it always seems to me that you, you can figure out what is well, going on. I, I tried to make them so I could figure them out. I had my, my agent one time said, uh, I know that you thought that no one would get this in this story, but I understand so and so. And I wrote back to her, if I had thought no one would get it, I wouldn't have put it in there. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're, you're obviously not just trying to be obscure to be obscure no. or something like that. No, there's, there's no purpose in that. But I am trying to show the way that things really seem to be. To me. Um, during the 60s, when you were evolving as a writer, were, were there any... Were you reading any writers during that period who helped sh shape your kind of a, a literary aesthetic during that period? Were there writers that you'd say were uh, especially important during that period? And were they, were they I, I gather that they were not just science fiction writers either. Proust, I've, obviously. I, no, I, I've never, never read science fiction exclusively. Uh, I had somebody ask me one time, this was in a personal letter, now that I come to think of it, uh, how long is it? How long do you read science fiction before you burn out? Because I read a lot of science fiction, I burn out, I don't want to see it again. And I said, I never burn out on science fiction because I never read it exclusively. I think that's dumb. Mm -hmm. I think that reading anything exclusively is dumb. Uh, I mix it with, uh, you know, ghost stories and mysteries and straight novels and what have you. Uh, we were talking about perception and so forth. And uh, you brought up Proust, who is considered a, a mainstream straight novelist. Uh, Proust is very, very big on the same thing that I was talking about in the book of his son, except that he did it 80 years before I did. Uh, memory, in the way that memory affects us. Yes. So uh, Proust mentions H.G. Wells, by the way, which bowled me over when I came across it. And so again, this this is coming back to what we were talking about. First, the, the thing that's called science fiction or SF or speculative fiction or whatever is really the mainstream of literature. I think that Proust is in that mainstream, but he's not classified as being in that mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, Gene, I, I haven't been able to figure out a question to ask, but I'll just just tell you, I, I wanted to try to figure out a way to ask you. Uh, precisely about this issue of memory, because it comes up in a lot of your... It's obviously at the center of, uh, of the Book of the New Sun. It's at the center of several other books. Uh, Peace, for example. Um, I don't know how to ask it, except that... Uh, do you have any explanation for why uh, you are so fascinated with memory, uh, that, that, it, that it seems to be one of the dominant concerns in your, uh, in your fiction? And I guess this is a kind of stupid question. That's why I couldn't figure out a good question, but could you say anything about it? I well, haven't... because it's all we have. Uh, the present is a knife edge. Uh, we were talking just a moment ago about how, how sharp the edge is. Mm -hmm. uh, the future really doesn't exist. Uh, that's why we can lay all these different stories there, uh, because it's no place. 
It has to come into being. All that we have is memory, racial memory in some cases, mm -hmm. uh, instinct. Instinct is just racial memory. Uh, the, the baby bird holds on to the branch because of the memory of hundreds of generations of birds that have fallen off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, little, little kids seem to be afraid of dragons or snakes or something. Little kids always know that there are terrible things out there in the dark that will eat you. Mm -hmm. And that's because, or at least it seems to me that it's because there were hundreds and hundreds of little kids who were in caves and huts and whatnot, and there were terrible things out in the dark that will eat you. Saber-toothed tigers, bears. And whatever. of course, uh, memory being the only thing we have, it's also, of course, uh, in some ways, it's its own kind of fiction maker itself. It's, a, it's something that's, you know, you, you watch people describing memories, and of course that process is a kind of uh, fiction making frequently. Well, this is something I said in the book of the New Sun. Severian not only remembers the event, but he remembers how he used to remember it, and he can see the differences between the way he used to remember it and the way he remembers it now. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, uh, back to that, that, that business about uh, in, the, in the 60s. You were reading, then you were reading widely then in the 60s. Were there, were there any writers, other writers, again, science fiction or not, that you in some ways looked to as a model or that you might see were, were kind of influencing your notion of what good writing is? The one, one I could name just immediately because I've been looking for some of the old books and I have a, a tendency to write my name and the date in a book when I finish it. And uh, I was seeing a lot of 60s dates in, 62, 63, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Is G.K. Chesterton, who today is one of the least popular writers going. Uh, I think he, he was a great writer, and I think he's going to come back. Uh, by the way, we, we, you also you asked about Sale to Damon Knight, which was my third sale, I think. And when I made that sale to Damon Knight, he wrote and said, uh, uh, who do you read? Uh, who do you like? And uh, I said that I read uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, Mark's Mechanical Han Engineer's Handbook, and G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the, Mark's Handbook was for style. But uh, it turned out that Damon Knight is also a big G.K. Chesterton fan. And he came back with this, oh, wonderful, you read Chesterton, you know. And so on. And he and I still, when we get together, we, we start talking about things like the Napoleon of Notting Hill, which is a wonderful forgotten fantasy novel mm -hmm. by D.K. Chesterton. Have you read it? No, I haven't. Uh, my it. wife is a big Chesterton fan. Uh, she really? loves that. that uh, is, it, is it Father Brown? Who's oh, the yes. detective? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and her fav I think her favorite book is this book, The Man the Thursday? Something about Thursday? The Man Who Was Thursday. Yeah. Again, a, a tremendous Chesterton story. From what I know of Chesterton, uh, he was very much somebody that was, you know... Here's some very early editions oh, wow. if you're interested. Yeah, look at this. Yeah. I think this is a father man. Wow. The Man Who's Thirsty, I think this is the first edition, 1908. Wow. This is just... Uh, Borges, you know, is a big fan of uh, Chesterton, as you well, probably know. You, you can tell that if, if I hadn't known it from reading interviews with Borges, which I, I, had, I did, I could tell it from his fiction, because uh, every once in a while you can, you can hear the Chesterton coming out in Borges' fiction. Let, let me, this is something that's related to this. This is amazing. Uh, um, I was thinking with Chesterton, and also uh, I was thinking of detective fiction, but also science fiction seems to me to be uh, an ideal form for writers interested in these issues, in a sense, uh, metaphysical issues that you're obviously interested in various ways. That is, the issues of perception and reality. They're, they're, it's almost set up to explore those issues. Well, Chesterton wrote uh, both science fiction and, and detective fiction. Uh, are you aware, for example, that... Uh, uh, Gideon Fell 
uh, was one of John Dixon Carr's detectives. Is modeled on Chesterton yeah, himself. No. no. There was, uh, at the time that Carr was living and working in London in the 30s, there was a club of detective mystery writers. Uh, Dorothy Sayers was a member. Mm -hmm. People like that. And Chesterton was the president of the club. Yeah. And Carr, as kind of an in joke, invented this uh, detective, Dr. Gideon Fell who was, as everybody who knew Chesterton recognized, simply G.K. Chesterton under a different name. Hmm. Well, that's it. I, I, didn't, I didn't have any idea about that. I'll have to mention that to my wife because she'll find that fascinating. She's been trying to get me to read the, the man who, who was Thursday for... Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm trying to check where the hell I can find a copy of it. See, I reviewed a biography of Chesterton for uh, the Washington Post, and I wanted to give you a copy of my review, yeah. if I can find it. I have some, some Xerox is about knocking around somewhere. There is the original, which I won't give you. Yeah, some, no. That's the original paper. I can, if nothing else, write the date down yeah. and get a copy of it myself. Okay, I, I'll turn it up for you here somewhere. Else. Gene, were you aware in the early 60s, of course, it was right at the time of Michael Moorcock, you know, the, the whole new wave kind of thing. Were you aware of that explosion that was going on? Or that oh, yeah. Yeah, I was published. I have one story in uh, New Worlds, yeah. which was what Moorcock was doing. And I used to, uh, I used to hash over the uh, Napoleon of Notting Hill with Jim Salas. Do you know of Jim Salas? No. You look quite a bit like him. Huh. Uh, Jim was a young writer who went over to London and was uh, an assistant editor on New Worlds. Moorcock was the editor for a while and uh, got into some, some very severe, uh, really psychiatric problems with extreme depression and this sort of thing. Stopped writing. And he's living in a Dallas suburb now, as far as I know, and working as a you know, respiratory therapist. And I don't think he's written anything for a long time. But uh, he lived in Notting Hill, which is a working-class London mm. neighborhood. Uh, so we, we used to talk about that. But, yeah, but I, I, I was aware of those yeah. people. And as I yeah. say, I stole, sold a very minor short story to New World. I still got some of those old magazines. Well, some of that, uh, some of the sort of cliches about the the new wave. Well, some of it's accurate too, of course. Is this attempt to sort of incorporate some of the modernist experimentation? You know, stand on Zanzibar, borrowing Dos Passos, or Brian Aldous borrowing, in a sense, Joy Joyce and uh, that that must have. Since you were reading so, you know, all kinds of different things, that 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 whole notion, which you probably had done independently in a way. I mean, that was obviously something that you would have been uh, interested in from the beginning. Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was a lot of people with literary backgrounds rather than scientific backgrounds who were applying those to science fiction in just the same way that people with scientific and engineering backgrounds, mm -hmm. Heinlein, for example, yeah. had applied uh, those backgrounds earlier. Uh, you know, you, you work with what you have. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was what those people had, and that's what they were applying. Uh, it didn't work uh, fundamentally, or at least it did not become popular. And, of course, it, as, as art, it worked in some cases and didn't work in others. Usually, it didn't, you know, everything usually doesn't. Uh, but it... It was handled in a way that made it too isolating to, to the reader, I think, too alienating, isolating mm -hmm. the word I wanted to the mm -hmm. uh, I was sorry uh, to see it happen. Ellison there was also a member of the new way. Mm -hmm. Ellison wrote, again, danger, or put together, assembled, edited, again, Dangerous Vision, right. which I've got three stories in. Mm -hmm. And that was when uh, new wave things were going on. Right. And people were were yelling at us, and we were yelling at them, and, so. and uh, 
at various times I was put in both camps by various people, uh, which seemed hmm. to me to be the way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're obviously one one gets a sneaking suspicion somewhere along the way that you have uh, you developed an interest in uh, Eastern philosophy or or uh, is that possible? Were you, oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm basically I'm religious, and uh, I tend to not scoff at that sort of thing uh, as soon as I pick it up. Most people uh, look at anything which is anything to do with uh, with religion, with metaphysics, or whatever, and mm -hmm. they, they consider it, you know, some kind of bullshit. Uh, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I don't dismiss it out of hand. I read it mm -hmm. and uh, try and make my own judgments on it. It's interesting how much today we hear about the interconnections between, uh, say, Eastern mysticism and quantum physics. Certainly. Uh, and as I said, that this, I think, filters into your books in various ways. Uh, you're, were, were you, again, this is just something you've, this, that's been an ongoing thing, though. Wasn't it all of a sudden in 1968 oh, you, no. you discovered... Uh, uh, Eastern mysticism or something. No, one, one of the writers that I grew up on when I was a, a little kid uh, reading on the sofa in the front room and so forth was Reggie Kipling. And Kipling had been raised in India and spent his boyhood until he, he was old enough to be sent off to a, you know, a, mm -hmm. a proper British school somewhere back in England, uh, in India. And uh, he had seen enough and known enough not to dismiss that sort of thing out of hand. I was kind of a, an early Kipling fan. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, which reminds me of Orwell's thing about the, the two people sitting under the tree. And the the uh, young man says, if you, do you like Kipling? And the uh, girl says, how would I know? I've never Kipled. <laughs> <laughs> which or Orwell has a, an essay on comic seaside postcards. Have you read Orwell's essays? Uh, yeah, some of them. Uh, some great stuff. Isn't yeah, it? oh yeah. What a what a prose writer he is. And he quotes that in one of their huh. one of his essays. I'm fairly sure that we're going to come across that Washington Post thing in this. Okay. If you're wondering why I'm paging through okay. this junk, and we just did, I'm just all right. All right. Okay, this is not my review of Chesterton. This is just an interview. I'm sorry. I thought, thought we had hit gold. Were you working on novels during the 60s? 60s well, the first where thing I tried to write in the, the 50s was a novel. Yeah. And uh, it didn't sell, and I've always kind of fluctuated back and forth. I think that you get an edge from writing short stories, and I think you tend to lose it writing novels. Huh. And when I feel like I'm losing it, I go back and I write a few short stories. I just got through doing a little period of that. I wrote a, an eminently silly story called The Choice of the Black Goddess, which is a, a crazy chess story. And I wrote a, a kind of a science fiction horror story that nobody seems to like, I'm not even sure that I still like it, called Talk of Mandrakes. And I wrote a mermaid story that I still like a lot called The Nebraskan and the Nerid, uh, which is about a, a folklore professor who goes to Greece to investigate the disappearance of uh, all the nymphs except the Nerids. If you go to, to Greece now and you, know, you collect the folk tales, uh, you never hear anything about uh, any other kind of nymph. Uh, only nerids appear. But nerids do appear in contemporary Greek folk tales, the kind of thing that yeah. you collect now from old people in backcountry mm -hmm. villages. And so he's looking into this, and of course he runs into a real nerd. As I'm sure you would <laughs> anticipate that yeah. you would. Well, uh... So in the 60s, uh, I was actually leading up to the sort of background of uh, the publication of your first novel, uh, Operation Ares. Mm -hmm. What 
was that the first novel you had written after that first unsuccessful novel, or were you working? No, I wrote another unsuccessful novel called The Black Dog, I think. It had several titles. The one I can remember is The Black Dog. It was like my daughter Teresa's cat, which has had 18 names, and the one that I can remember is Tinsel, which was the name of the cat when she got it. But... Uh, so it wasn't something like you were just like building up to it, writing a novel? Oh, no. No, no. I, I wrote a number of things, and I wrote one called... I was getting this confused with The Black Dog, but they're two different books. I wrote one called The Minaj Museum that I still think was a pretty decent novel. But uh, it was a little too strange, I think. Uh, in the middle of the book, uh, a, an exotic dancer uh, goes to bed with her manager. And then the second half of the book is all told by the fetus that she's carrying that's been huh. engendered. At this. See, this sounds like a Wolfian device. Here. And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, Gardner does what? You know Gardner does what? No. Huh. Gardner has a reputation of being the, the flakiest person in science fiction. Gardner edited this book right here. I like Gardner, and I hope he likes me anyway, because, as I say, I like him. Uh, but he looks like an orangutan. He looks exactly like somebody went to a zoo and found a large, fat orangutan and waved a magic wand and said, you are going to be a human being, or at least something close to, to that. And uh, he, he is a you know, uh, a real, real surviving hippie mm -hmm. who would be just fine in Doonesbury. Uh, I'm getting off on the, to something else, but I'm going to get off onto it. Okay. Maybe I'll think about where okay. I started anyway. Um, but anyway, Gardner used to be extremely poor. And he was trying to make a living writing short stories, which is mm -hmm. murder. Yeah. And his wife was some kind of a social worker, and I don't think was making anything. And they were living in this, the, the worst apartment I have ever been in my life, in Philadelphia. Uh, this was a real bad slum area. Yeah. And uh, so I was in Philadelphia, and I called up Gardner said, you know, let's go out and have dinner or something. And uh, so he and his wife came and we went out and had dinner. And we went back to this really terrible, terrible area of Philadelphia. This, and uh, sat around in the, the uh, apartment and drank cheap wine until 2 a.m. or something like that. And uh, then he said, you know, I'd better walk you back to the hotel because it's a real bad area. And I said, okay, great. So he put on his batwing cowboy hat. And this is a man with <laughs> orange hair down here and an orange beard. You know the color that an orange is? Yeah, it's yeah. That color. And his jeans and his cowboy boots. And uh, we walked way back to the hotel. And we went by this, through this really bad area. And there People sitting yeah. on the curb, yeah. you know. There are guys standing in doorways, you know, looking out for this picture. And all this sort of thing. And I noticed they had this strange expression on their face. I'd never never noticed this expression before. And I got about halfway back to the hotel before I realized they were afraid of us. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <coughs> that was so great. But I don't know why I got off on well, the garden. Um it might have been. I, I was. I was. I was <coughs> oh, that, that book. Yeah, that book. I found out years and years later that Gardner had been a slush pile reader for one of the publishers to whom I had submitted that book, huh. and he had said, "This is really just too freaky for us," and sent it back. <laughs> well, I, I notice in what is it the dedication to the fifth head of Cerberus? Cerberus, uh, you you say to what is it to to Fred? Pole, I visit to Fred Pole. Damon Knight. Damon Knight, who one night in 1966 grew me from a bean, 
Was that a specific thing that that happened? Was yeah. that a specific yeah. night? What was the that anecdote? Well, to, to go back a little bit, I told you about the story I sold to the Skin Magazine. Yeah. Uh, the Dead Man. Right. I sold another story to Worlds of It, and that was edited at that time by Frederick Pohl, by the way. Okay. And what happened there was I wrote a story called The Mountains Are Mice. And the, the meaning of the title was uh, the mountains are laboratory animals. The mountains are where the experiments are carried out. Okay. So I sent it to Galaxy. And at that time, I, as I think I said earlier, I was very naive about marketing. And I had no idea who the hell was mm -hmm. editing Galaxy. Turned out it was being edited by Fred Cole. And I got back with a rejection slip which is the way I got everything yeah. else back except the dead man, the one story that I had sold. And I was working from a uh, one of these lists published in the Writer or yeah. Writer's Digest. And the next magazine on the list, this was Science Fiction Markets, was mm -hmm. If. Mm -hmm. And, uh, sorry, I addressed another envelope and sent it to If. And I got back a letter from the editor, Fred Pohl, with a check. And uh, the letter said, uh, I'm glad you let me see this again. I think the rewrite really improved it. <laughs> <laughs> there was no rewrite. That's funny. <laughs> at all. But, uh, and by the that's, way, that's I've been anecdote. telling this story for years, and Fred Pohl has never bought another word from me. <laughs> but anyway, that story appeared. And I got a letter from Lloyd Biggle. Do you know Lloyd Biggle at all? Uh -huh. He's a science fiction writer who lives in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And at that time, he was a uh, an officer of SFWA. And he wrote, said, you're invited to join SFWA. Of course, he had sent it to if and if yeah. forwarded it to me. It's a science fiction writer. And I thought, well, this is, sounds okay. I'll do it. I got, it. I got a listing there of markets, and that was how I found out about Orbit. Okay. And I wrote a story called Trip Trap. Right. Have you read it? Yeah. Oh, good. So I sent it to uh, Damon Knight, who was editing Orbit, and I got it back with a letter that said, I like this story a whole lot, but uh, I think that it needs to, to switch here from viewpoint A to viewpoint B, and this is why. And I think it needs to switch here from viewpoint B back to viewpoint A, okay. and this is why. And a long list of very sensible suggestions like that. And I lay on bed on the bed in our bedroom, which is we were living in Ohio on Betty Brown. And went through this, and somewhere through this, I suddenly realized, by golly, I'm actually a writer now. Mm -hmm. I'm a writer. So it was that uh, that that was that almost always happened that with was writers. It. it was a moment yeah. where you 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 realize that you're you're a writer. Yeah, right. You know that was it. And uh, so I I said something about that to Damon, and uh, Damon came back and with something like, I never knew I grew you from a bean, or something like that. Huh. So, then I grabbed that. Yeah. For the anthology. The, the, not the anthology. For the, the dedication. Servers for the dedication. The only people, the only person that really helped me with my writing when I needed help was Damon May. I've gotten a lot of help from other people since. Mm -hmm. But... Before I'd gotten any recognition, uh, the person that helped me was Damon Knight. And I'll never really be able to, to repay him for that. I've made some stabs at him. Were they, was it mainly, when you say he was giving you help, was it mainly simply in uh, technical matters of, of making you more aware of certain possibilities or something? Well, a, lot, just of it, a lot of it was technical. Uh, a lot of it was... Uh, just direction. We, I don't think yeah. this is coming through. Yeah. Uh, do we really need this explanation here? It will mm -hmm. come out later in the story anyway. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that sort of material. Mm -hmm. And basically, he was buying me and giving me confidence in myself, yeah. and nobody else was buying me.